which above all others, which has been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So, born in 18, not 18, 1782, William Miller was born into a family of, that was no stranger to poverty. He was raised by religious parents, so he was no stranger to Christianity. But as a young man, as he continued growing uh, in maturity, he, he came into uh, contact with some people who professed to be deists. So these are those who, um, they, they think there might be a God, but he just, he's not really involved in the world, and how can we know that the Bible's really true kind of thing? And so he kind of got swayed by their belief system. And he pursued this and professed it himself, but he found uh, no peace in that system. And, and, and try as, as, he might, as he might, he could not find happiness. Uh, but about the age of 34, he was impressed with the fact that he was a sinner in need of a savior. It's just the problem was, if he didn't believe in the Bible, how could there be a savior? But the Holy Spirit was still working on his heart. And the more he thought about his condition, the more he had these different questions, he, he realized he had this lack of hope, this, this fear of death and eternity. And the more he thought, the more confused he was, the more questions he had. But then, he discovered Jesus in a new way. He eventually turned away from his deism, and he began studying the Bible verse by verse. And he found Jesus to not only be his savior, but his best friend. And the Bible, his greatest textbook. And his greatest comfort. He, he set out to examine all the apparent contradictions that he thought there were in the Bible. And even though he didn't understand everything, he decided that he would fully embrace Jesus. Is it working? Okay. So he says this, I saw that the Bible did bring to view just such a savior as I needed, and I was perplexed to find how an uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. I was constrained to admit, William Miller says, that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. The Savior became to me the chiefest among ten thousand, and the scriptures, which were before dark and contradictory, now became the lamp to my feet and the light to my path. My mind became settled and satisfied. I found the Lord God to be a rock in the midst of the ocean of life. The Bible now became my chief study, and I can truly say that I searched it with great delight. I found the half was never told me. I wondered why I had not seen its beauty and glory before and marveled that I could have ever rejected it. I found everything revealed that my heart could desire and a remedy for every disease of the soul. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. And as we said, he decided that he was going to study these, the Bible verse by verse. And if anything was too difficult to understand, he'd find similar verses or similar words that were used in other verses, and he would make the Bible its own interpreter. And in fact, that's become such a pillar in our church that it's really a defining point of who we are. Even still, he spent even whole nights in, in, in Bible study, and he came across Daniel 8.14, which tells us the time prophecy. And in his continuing study, he learned through the Bible that in cases of time prophecy, a prophetic day equals a literal year. And the scriptures he learned from, got this from, were Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel 4, verse 6. After the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities. Even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. And Ezekiel, and, that, and when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. And with this in view, he began to understand that the prophecy in Daniel 8.14 was not 2300 days, 
literal days, but years. Now, the popular view, if I can get this to work, the popular view in the 1800s was that the earth was the sanctuary, and that the cleansing of the earth would be, that the cleansing of the sanctuary would be the purifying of the earth by fire. And so, thinking this, William Miller thought that if he could find the beginning date for this prophecy, he could, re- he could figure out when Jesus was going to return. And so he began searching. Now, to find the beginning of, this, of the largest time prophecy in the Bible, we need to go to Daniel 9. And we find a very concise explanation where the angel, I believe it was the angel Gabriel, came to Daniel. Starting in verse 24, he begins explaining uh, the 2300 day prophecy to Daniel in smaller chunks and so he tells him first the Jews have 70 weeks which uh, multiplies out to 490 days or literal years and then he tells Daniel this know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem Unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. But does such a command appear in the Bible? In history, we find actually three or four different commands, decrees, if you will, that allow the Jews, in some form or another, to go back to Jerusalem. Cyrus issued a decree decree in 538 or 37 BC. But this can't be the decree be simply because it doesn't fit when Jesus was anointed as the Messiah, which was in 27 AD. Darius the Great gave a decree, but we don't know the date of that. And more than that, neither of these decrees uh, can be the decree we're looking for simply because the, the command in Daniel 9 is very specific. It refers to the, the whole of Jerusalem being rebuilt, and neither of those decrees, other two decrees, fit. Uh, the only one that we know fits is a decree given by Artaxerxes in 457 BC, and you can find this decree in Ezra chapter 7, uh, starting about verse 11. This is the only one that fits the timing and the details. Now, as we already stated, uh, the first time chunk is, of the 2300 days is the 70 weeks, or 490 literal years. We find uh, this verse in Daniel 9:24, which says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the, thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, as, as the verse states, the Jews had 490 years to get their act together. Uh, they had such a long history of rebellion and apostasy, and this, this cycle of returning to God and returning to apostasy, and, and that God had to give them a cutoff point. He was giving them nearly 500 years as one final chunk of time, to make their final decision as a nation for or against him. But even this 70 week chunk, as William Miller discovered, is broken into still smaller chunks. As Daniel 9.25, we already read, uh, gives us these 70, uh, 70 weeks, but it breaks it down into seven weeks, into 62 weeks, and one final week. Now, if I can get this to work. Now, there was Artaxerxes' command in 457 BC, and that, as we'll see, we take the seven weeks, the smallest chunk, one of the smallest chunks, and the rebuilding was completed in totality in 408 BC. And then we have Jerusalem, uh, plus another 434 years, and that takes us to Jesus being anointed as Messiah in, the, in 27 AD. And then we have one final week, which is broken up into still smaller chunks. 
And in fact, the Bible tells us in, like, in verse 26 that the Messiah would be cut off in the midst of the week. It says he would confirm the covenant for one week. And in the midst of that week, he would be cut off or crucified. And that's exactly what happened. In, in 31 AD, Jesus was crucified. And we take three and a half years on top of that. And Stephen was stoned. And Israel's probation as a nation was permanently closed. Now, as we said at the beginning of this final week, Jesus was baptized and anointed. And then in the middle, he was crucified. At the end, Stephen was stoned. And as the song said, God is always on time. He's never early, never late. And this is one way that we can trust the Bible so much is all the different time prophecies that we have. They're verifiable by even secular history. And as we, we know, the Jews made their decisions. They, they, they ceased being the chosen people of God, exactly when the prophecy said it would happen. Now, as William Miller continued studying and understood better these prophecies, he was filled with the urgency that Jesus was coming soon. And he began to share these findings in private at first, when he had the chance, but he couldn't silence this conviction that he had to share publicly. He was con convicted that God wanted him to share his findings with the world, but still he waited for another nine years, he waited until he could no longer fight the conviction. Ultimately, those who really love Jesus will eventually give in to him. In 1831 is when he began to publicly preach that Jesus was coming soon. In 1833, he was actually given a license to preach by the Baptist Church. But William Miller, and this is fascinating, William Miller was not the only one that God was raising up to give this message. He was just the one in the United States. I believe it was somewhere in Europe, I think maybe even maybe Germany. Uh, God raised up a man by the name of Joseph Wolf, Dr. Joseph Wolf, who was born a Jew. Eventually he became Christian, and because of that newfound faith, he was, he was kicked out from his family. He left his father's house, went to stay with somebody else, and they kicked him out. Um, people in England, people in South America, in great controversy, says this. Page 362 says a similar belief was found by another missionary to exist in Tap. Tatari, I'm not sure how to say that. A Tatar priest put to the question, put the question to a missionary when Christ would come the second time, and the missionary answered that he knew nothing about it. And the priest seemed greatly surprised at such ignorance in one who professed to be a Bible teacher. And he stated his own belief, which was founded on prophecy, that Christ would return about 1844. Even in England in 1826, the Advent message began to be preached. Uh, it says the movement here did not take so definite a form as in America, but the, it was preached nonetheless. Even in South America, a Jesuit uh, by the name of Lacunza began studying the Bible, and he arrived at the same conviction that Jesus was coming soon around 1844. In Germany, a man named Bengel arrived at the same conclusion. In other parts of the world, as we said, these men were preaching the same messages, and these men didn't know each other. And sure, there was, some, there was someone who would hear the message and take it somewhere else and share it. But by and large, these, men, these people that were sharing the message did not know each other. You see, when God raises up a movement, he goes big. God never goes small when it's something this important. We have, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have incredible and incredible heritage. Um, I've had the privilege of going on a couple of trips over the years, once in high school, once a couple of years ago, of um, learning about Adventist heritage and, and how we came to be as people. Um, you know, the Bible tells us in Revelation 14, there's three very important messages. And during, in these messages, the first angel tells us to fear God and give glory to him because his judgment has come. But most of Protestant America in the time of William Miller, they rejected these messages 
that most of these people left, had to leave these church, their churches that accepted this doctrine because most Christians hated it, which led to the second angel's announcement that Babylon was fallen. You know, as a result of them rejecting this truth, many had to separate from their brethren. Even though they didn't want to, they didn't see any other choice. But they wanted to follow Jesus even more. And they are described by the third angel, which tells us that here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And um, we'll learn later on this week a little bit more about that specifically. And then the call rings out to these people, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you be receive not of her plagues. Included in this group of people were Ellen Gold, Harmon, and her family. More on that later in the series. See, these people loved Jesus so much that they felt that there was no other option. They had to leave those who did not love the truth and join those who did love the truth. Those who joined Miller were often called Millerites. Initially, Jesus was predicted to return in 1843, but as the time came and went, they realized they were wrong. And eventually, they studied, they got the date right into 1844, October 22nd, 1844. It's been 173 years today. But again, that came and went, and they realized they were wrong. Some doubted they had ever been right to begin with. Some left the movement because they had joined because of fear or because, they were, because of the disappointment. But if Jesus was not going to return in 1844, what happened? Now, keep coming back, and we'll learn more. But the Bible gives us exactly the information of what happened. See, the Millerites knew they had gotten the date right. But obviously, they were wrong about the event. So they continued studying and praying and imploring God to reveal to them where they went wrong. And after continued study, they came to the conclusion that the earth was not the sanctuary that the Bible declared would be cleansed. And if the earth isn't the sanctuary, then what are we talking about? What is the sanctuary? Now, to learn more about this, we go to the Old Testament, when Israel was given a blueprint by God. In this blueprint that he gave to Moses and to Israel, it contained exact specifications for the building of the ancient temple that... Uh, declared to us in types and symbols the love of God, the gospel in Old Testament language that would save the world. Now, Israel had uh, seven holidays in their ancient religion, and one of these, one of the final ones, was the Day of Atonement. Now, on this day, Israel was not to work, and this was such a strong command, it was given under the pain of death. During this day, each Israelite was to search their hearts. Were they hanging on to sin? then they needed to repent of that and to forsake their sins. And we, you can study this more in detail in Leviticus 16 and in Leviticus 23, uh, from verses 27 to 32. While the Israelites were individually searching their hearts, the high priest was to do the work symbolizing what literally began in 1844. The sins of the people of Israel had to be symbolically cleansed from the ancient temple. And Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So if there was no sanctuary on earth in the time of 1844, but the sanctuary had to be cleansed, then what are we talking about? Now, when we go on to Hebrews chapters 8 and 9, the Bible tells us it's not an earthly temple. And that's because the temple of the Old Covenant had been destroyed and it's not going to be rebuilt. But it, so if it's not the earthly temple that Jesus in, entered into, it must be the heavenly temple. Hebrews 8 says, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Hebrews 9 tells us, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and, 
by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So they discovered that Jesus was not going to come and cleanse the earth, at least not yet, but that he was beginning the final phase of his high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, being the modern spiritual Israel of today, we, 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 we need to make sure that we're doing the same work of heart searching, the same work of repenting and forsaking our sins. And may we, if we haven't done that, then let's, go, let's, let's get started because Jesus is coming soon. So shall we pray one more time? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the prophecies that never fail, and your love that has given them to us. Help us to keep studying and to keep growing closer to you and to, to forsake those things that separate us from you because you are returning soon. Help us to love you with all our hearts. In your name, Jesus, amen.